Can you? Uh, I guess you can. Cause I can hear myself. Um, I'm David Dahl. I work as the tree nut uh, homology advisor over here in Merced County, so covering this area for almonds, pistachios, and walnuts. I know many of you know me. It's great to see your faces again. And I guess uh, I'm guess a lot of you are probably happy to have the year, if not done, nearly completed. I can imagine. Uh, so, uh, I saw. We have Jalindra who's going to be presenting on insects, so I won't cover anything regarding to probably insect and pest management in that regard. So we're going to focus a little bit more on post-harvest practices moving into the dormant period and then probably coming into uh, the season next year when it comes to irrigation and nutrient management as well as tie that back into uh, horticultural practices as well. First thing is uh, this is a good time to do some pruning. If you're planning to do any pruning in your orchard, limbing up trees to get those snags out of the way, taking limbs out of the orchard, uh, this pruning at this as early as this point does not negatively impact trees, and it's actually a good time to prune mature trees. I had a question just come in by email this morning, is it all right to start pruning young trees on third leaf? And, and generally, I think yes. Uh, it looks like we're going to have cooler temperatures hopefully through the rest of October, and then by, by the time that occurs, the days will then be short enough that we shouldn't be seeing any uh, spur of any new bud development on these young trees. Uh, so keep that in mind if you want to start a little earlier, um, you can on your young trees, but generally most people move through and do the mature tree pruning at this time of year. And uh, studies, I think almost 20 years ago now, are suggesting that there's no negative impact on that. When it comes to young tree pruning, now we, we keep continuing to find an increase in the number of these wood canker fungal pathogens that are invading these pruning wounds. This has a lot to do with the fact that we have an increasing footprint of perennial crops, and that's not just almond, but pistachio, walnut, grapes as well. As well as we tend to grow our trees a little bit more vigorously, so we are making larger cuts onto these trees, which then essentially makes a larger landing pad for that spore to find. Now these fungal pathogens, the spores are tied to uh, being released with rain events. So when we get rain events that appear immediately preceding the rainfall, through about the 12 to 20 hours, 24 hours after the rainfall is when you're getting the spores movement. And they actually require a wind splash rain in order to disperse. So what does that mean? It means generally we don't like to prune when we have rain in the foreseeable forecast. Um, sometimes it's easier to do that in the spring with young trees. Sometimes it's easier to do it in the fall. Um, more so with the recent weather trends, it seems to be in the fall, we get, tend to get less rains and the rains kind of seem to persist through the springtime period. So keep that in mind, you're pruning your first and second leaf almonds. I know a lot of people like to wait until they're dormant. Um, generally, I think as long as you wait to the point where you're not going to get regrowth out of those apical buds, that's when I would target it. And that's probably going to be, again, with this weather, probably within the next week or so, we, we'd probably be safe to start taking those cuts. Um, I should add that traditionally, a lot of people will prune later just because of bacterial canker, especially in sandy soil, where they want which scaffold would be uh, susceptible to disease or succumb to disease and they cut those off. But in heavier soils that we have on the west side, my thought is you can probably prove it any time from probably late October all the way through March to full leaf expansion with no impact on tree growth. So you got a big window there to get that job done. And I should add that um, all our studies are suggesting that pruning doesn't really yield you more nuts. Uh, so prune the structure of those trees uh, to try to provide support both spatially around and up and you know around the tree as well as up and down. So you're preventing them from growing into the, the, the limbs to grow in, into each other too early or what we call included tissue. That will provide a little bit more structural stability to that tree. But there's no magic number, three, four, five. It just depends on how high you headed the trees and then um, how well the scaffolds are spaced around those. Um, when it comes to long pruning, and there's some interesting uh, work that Roger Duncan's been doing where he has went through and hedged trees in the wintertime. I know a lot of people like using hedges because it's simple, it's relatively quick. Um, but what he's found is if you hedge, uh, let's say, a second leaf tree going into the third year, by the end of the third year, the trees you left unhedged and the ones you hedge are exactly the same height. So uh, what you tend to see difference is the type of growth that's that's associated with that. When you make a heading cut, which is a cut like this, you take the head off, you'll tend to invigorate that shoot and you'll get, uh, in that following uh, spring, you'll get this rapid growth by one or two shoots associated with that. If you leave that limb go, 
and you don't head it, what you tend to get is more lateral growth off of that wood. So the question I always ask is, why are you, why are you wanting to hedge these trees? Some people hedge them because they like to look. I can't tell you not to do that if that's what you want to do. Um, some people say it helps them reduce uh, wind breakage in the winter. Maybe there's some truth to that. I think we, we still need to evaluate that, but keep that in mind. Um, the other, uh, there's also a group of people saying this helps us keep a smaller tree growing through the spring. And I don't necessarily know if that's true. And if your goal is to prevent you from having uh, scaffold breakage in the spring, you might actually want to look at an in-season type of heading cut uh, rather than a dormant heading cut. Because an in-season heading cut does uh, decrease the rate of growth of that tree that you cut. So uh, kind of keep that in mind that a dormant heading cut will invigorate the shoot an in-season cut will actually slow down that, that rapid implementation of that shoot in the fall and spring. And I know hedgers are becoming more popular because of labor, um, but you know they do make indiscriminate cuts across that field. Uh, moving on to uh, fertilization and, and uh, irrigation, you know we're kind of getting to the point where these trees just aren't using much water. Um, it's always important to make sure that you're keeping them relatively fully irrigated for the first eight weeks after harvest. So that's going to take you about to the end of October, uh, which will be here pretty quickly. Actually, middle of October, excuse me, depending on where you are. Um, fertilizer, there's still enough time to get some nitrogen into these trees. Uh, at this point, nitrogen actually gets actively pumped into the tree through the, uh, just a uh, general process of the tree. It's not moving as much through mass flow. Uh, and so if, if you have uh, mid-July leaf tissue that's saying that you're probably below 2.5% or less, I guess that's below 2.5%, 2.5% or less on your mid-July leaf tissue, it's a good time to probably go ahead and apply some fertilizer in this post-harvest period in regards to nitrogen, it's referring to nitrogen with that 2.5% to uh, boost back up the reserves within the tree. Now interestingly, if you're over 2.5%, there's probably not much to gain from making applications at this time. Uh, the tree is sufficient, it's not going to waste the energy to pump more nitrogen into the tree when it's at a sufficient level. Uh, it's a better way of thinking about it, although it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, so look, look back at that mid-July. If you're at 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, probably don't need to even go out and put on that post harvest slug. Uh, one reason I, I bring that up is because, boy, as we keep increasing that leaf nitrogen, we're increasing our haul rod issues that we continually get calls about every single year. And so uh, we, we do know that as we have more nitrogen in our tree, and as we increase the rates of application onto these trees, we get more haul rot. And that's simply associated to that increased nitrogen content within the tree actually seems to be making that hull more susceptible to fungal infection. So a little bit interesting, I always thought it was, it was more to a delay of onset of harvest. That was the recent work is suggesting, um, actually it's new work, but it was on some work that was done with that nitrogen study, that nitrogen doesn't delay the, off, the progression of a hull split, but rather it seems to make the hull more susceptible to the hull rot fungi. So keep that in mind of, um, when you're trying to go into nectarous management that it starts now. And when it comes to foliar nutrients, I'm, I'm a relatively large advocate of putting on some foliar boron as well as uh, to the ground if, um, if you need it. So this is where that hull analysis that uh, should have been taken at harvest comes into play. It's probably the most, more recently, especially in east side soils with sand, it's probably the most efficient most impactful deficient micronutrient. I've seen orchards where whole boron comes in at 50 to 60 pounds and the farmer's wondering why their yields have never been above 2,000. Well, that's a good reason why. We, we need to have adequate amount of boron within these trees in order for the flower to properly develop, in order for the pollen to actually be able to fertilize the head and fertilize the auger. So uh, pull those whole, those whole analysis for boron uh, check them out. If you're probably below 90, 95 ppm, you probably want to put a little bit of boron out into the ground. Um, somewhere around uh, 2 pounds of actual boron, that's about 10 pounds of soluble. If you're a little bit more deficient, you can increase that rate. Well, those people on your side, you're probably, uh, probably not too little boron, it could be too much, but nonetheless, that whole boron is important to know where it is. And the reason is, is that all is a single boron. So everybody says, well, I'm going to pull these samples. I can tell you how much boron I have in my tree.
tree by pulling leaf samples. Complete bogus. I've used another turbine on film. Um, I've done multiple uh, comparisons with studies where we pulled block after block, quarter section after quarter section, compared leaf to, to the boron status. I could have 45 ppm in the leaf, and I had 60 in the hull, and then I had 130 in the hull, and then 35 in the leaf. There's no rhyme or reason. Um, again, that's the importance of that hull boron. It's just because the boron, get, it's, it's, uh, the hull is a sink part, so it tends to run to the tree and it concentrates the greatest in the true indication of status of the tree. Um, so we looked at that hull boron, and for over 90, 95, 100 ppm, um, still we found that it pays to make a post-harvest, essentially a foliar application between post-harvest and paint bus. Bronze Dater Holster has shown that post-harvest applications are very effective in applying foliar boron. Uh, it makes sense. You have a bigger leaf surface to capture that boron to pull it into the tree. So if you're running your race through, definitely put some boron. Um, we, we do know that that spray between post-harvest and paint bud, it will essentially pay for itself and not make you more money than the $5 it's going to cost you for the product. At that point, you're using around 0.2 to 0.4 pounds of, act of actual boron per, per acre, and that's about one to two pounds of solubor. Uh, it's about two pounds of solubor is what we typically recommend in that spray. So you're going through, put in a little bit of zinc. Um, see, especially if you're on Nemagar, it seems like we're always deficient in zinc, and especially when you have young trees coming into the spring. Uh, rolling over to the other fur the the, the other big uh, fertilizer withdrawal is potassium. We actually use more potassium in our orchards than we do nitrogen. I know that seems hard to believe. Uh, we withdraw about 65 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 1,000 kernel pounds, and about 72 pounds of, of elemental potassium. When we bump that up, that's for that to get that potassium back on the field, we have to apply about 96 pounds of potassium oxide. Uh, so for every 1,000 pounds, that's about 180 to 190 pounds of SOP that you have to reapply to the ground if you're using that product. But of course, there's all kinds of other products. Um, but if you are using SOP, um, sulfate of potash, uh, potassium sulfate, now's a good time to get that material out if you're on heavy soil. Um, applying it as uh, most people will traditionally will band it, but I think throwing it a little bit wider because it is a salt to help make sure that you're maintaining good root activity underneath there is a good process. Um, many people you'll see will be like a, a six to eight inch band. I like seeing that a little bit wider. Spread that salt out a little bit to help make sure that you're not feeling the root underneath it because it is a salt and it will have the osmotic effect. So uh, if you're on sandier soil, which I know there's a few people who came coming over from the east side, I, I would encourage if you're on like this, if you're on a, a dell, if you're on a true sand, a loamy sand to a sand, you can probably withhold these potassium applications so a little bit later in the year, mainly due to the inability to hold that cation within the soil. Uh, we've been having good luck in some sands near uh, near Livingston to actually make that application in February, just right before bloom and it seemed that he's getting a little bit bigger bang for the buck and keeping more potassium in the system. So up here, what you're looking for on heavier soil is the rain to help carry it into the root zone, and you have the ability for it to stick to all the charge sites because there's, it's, a, it's a finer part of the soil. But when you get to a coarser, a, a lower exchange capacity soil, you have to change the timing of the application to make sure that the potassium is present in the seed. Uh, the last one is phosphorus. I, I get uh, questions on phosphorus every year. You know, the, the, the big thing is, is we haven't really been able to document what we call phosphorus deficiency in a tree, but some people believe that we, we don't have adequate phosphorus levels in our tree. Again, I refer back to our, our, our leaf tissue analysis from mid-July. You're seeing that's probably less than what I think it's 0 0.13, 0 0.12. Uh, you probably want to start looking at maybe applying a little bit of phosphorus to the fields especially if, you, if it has a history of a high phosphorus using crop. Um, we don't export a lot of phosphorus. We don't export a lot of phosphorus from our fields, which is why uh, we probably don't see a lot of deficiency. It's somewhere around seven to eight pounds of actual elemental phosphorus. We multiply that with phosphorus and oxide that's around 10 to 11 pounds. We're pulling out 65 pounds of nitrogen, 72 pounds of potassium, and 7 to 8 pounds.
lines of phosphorus. So you can get the, you get the big idea of how much we're pulling out of these fields and with every thousand per pounds. I get this question, I forgot to cover it before, but when we say 1,000 kernel pounds, that number is based on the extraction that we get from the whole shells kernel. We've already moved uh, into the value that's important to you guys, which is how many kernel pounds per acre. So it's 65 nitrogen, which has an efficiency, so it's about 85 pounds of applied nitrogen, 65, 72 pounds of potassium, which means 96 pounds of potassium oxide. 7 to 8 pounds of phosphorus, which means you get applied about 10 to 12 pounds of phosphorus pentoxide to run through those numbers. Okay, so protein, uh, nutrients, and uh, water. Um, if you're dealing with some salt problems and you want to continue leaching, it's, it's probably all right to continue irrigating through this period. But as the days get shorter and the weather gets cooler, thankfully cooler, uh, the transpiration rates are dropping as well as the status of the tree. Uh, we're probably looking at maybe. You know, another week or two of, of, of irrigation into these orchards um, until really you probably start slowing down unless the temperatures increase or no rains in the forecast. Um, you know, I would probably say we're, we're, we're getting towards the end of the irrigation season. I want to flip this around next year. Well, I want to back up. Um, then I'll get to that point. If you are dealing with a salt problem, this could be boron, this could be sodium, this could be fluoride, um, you want to probably reconsider a dormant leaching program. We talked about this in the past, but again, starting around Thanksgiving, and I always say starting around Thanksgiving, you essentially want to start filling that profile, try to get on between four to six inches to get some moisture into that ground. And once you kind of get to that point, you can probably pull back to maybe the first week of January to see if any rain comes in, and then re start reapplying water in early January if needed. And soil such as this, you're probably looking at the need between 8 and 12 inches of applied water with the hope of getting 6 to 8 inches to get a good of rain to get a good effective leaching program. If you're on more of a sandy loam uh, or a coarser soil, you're probably looking at you know 2 to 3 inches less of applied water to help you with that. Um, give you an idea, we can we can clean up soils in the sandy part of Merced County with easily a foot of water. Um, so if we get 10 to 12 inches of rain, it does a really nice job. Um, some work that I've done off of uh, Cam and I-5, it takes us about a foot of applied water plus about 6 to 8 inches of rain in order to drop those ECs from about 4 to 4.5 to about 1 to 1.25 on an average root system with salinity level. So, you get an idea that you can you can really do a nice job of reducing that if you did. Okay, so um, for that cover, just about it. Uh, some pest management for the winter. I know uh, Jolindra is going to be talking quite a bit about sanitation, um, but if you're dealing with bacterial spot, sanitation is the primary means of managing that that problem. It seems to be an issue mostly on Fritz and Padre. So if you see if you've seen any red gummy nuts in your trees, uh, there's a good chance it could be that. Getting those mummies out of the trees is is important because that's the primary source of inoculum for the next season. Um, there has been, uh, I always get concerns every year about lichen. Uh, although lichen probably has no negative impact on the tree, it does seem that it at height scale from parasitoids. So if you don't like it or you don't like to look, if you're not liking to like it, you can probably hit it with a little bit of copper or liquid lime sulfur using kind of leaves up pretty well in those orchards as you get into this kind of area. Uh, other than that, uh, that's kind of about really where we are. Uh, there's not really much we need to worry about any late season leaf diseases that come in. Uh, as you can tell, as long as you have the green on them and they're not putting the green leaves, you're setting yourself up uh, very well for the coming season. So, um, I guess with that, I'll take any questions. We've covered a lot of topics there. Okay. I was going to say, so you kids can't let go this year. Does it take for that pruning wound to heal after you make the cut? 
It's dependent upon size. Of course, I'm a typical university guy, it always depends. But minimally, it's probably 10 days for anything about a size of a nickel to a quarter, extending all the way out to two to three weeks for as, as the cuts get larger. So, but the longer you get from that period of cut, the less susceptible it is to infection. Um, but we have been able to document um, large cuts to be able to be infected up to three to four weeks after the wound was made. Um, I should add that uh, I get calls every year between the difference between pruning wounds and ceramic cystis. And, and, uh, when limbs break, you get infections of that pocket or that tissue that's exposed. Uh, and now, recently, with Ganoderma around the base of the tree, you know, this stuff is, is, is out there, and I think it's always been out there. Uh, but now we farm things a little bit differently. I mean, if you probably remember back 15, 20 years ago, did you ever shake your tree? Did you ever shake your tree twice in a, in a year? I mean, now we're seeing that become more common with winter sanitation. So, that, I mean, as we shift practices to becoming more mechanized, we're actually increasing the damage to these trees and creating more wounds. Does that mean they're gonna, we're going to have shorter length orchard lives? We don't know, but. Uh, Taking good care and training your 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 shaker operators to do a very good job on on your trees and then marking is important. And I'd add, it's, I know you guys just been through harvest, but every year I get calls from from people who have bark trees, and it's just one after another after another. And if you're working with an operator, tell them if they bark one or two trees, to stop, to stop, come back. I know everybody's in a hurry to get harvest done, but. When you walk into a third leaf orchard and you see 60% of the trees barked, yeah, you, yeah, that's the feeling I have. So I just look down and almost, I don't even know what to say. So, uh, but keep that in mind. We don't usually see a lot of damage in the winter time because we're not shaking as hard, but there is probably some, uh, some damage to these trees because of how we are shaking to do that. And uh, so keep that in mind, you know, more, more shaking probably is impacting the way our orchards are, are, are surviving these days. Um, any other questions? Is there anything you can daub those uh, cuts with, your big cuts? Yeah, so that's a good question as well. So the short answer is yes. Um, it, there does seem to be a, a, a couple different fungicides that are effective. Uh, but some work out of Australia is showing that uh, using acrylic paint is actually probably one of the more effective tools to use. And this isn't latex, it's acrylic. So it's a little bit thicker, it, it, seems, it allows it to expand a little bit more. So at this point, our, our general recommendation is when you're making relatively large cuts on the trees, uh, and rain is in the foreseeable forecast, then you might want to consider going through some, uh, some acrylic paint. Um, and it's a little bit different than that rubberized stuff that people spray on their trees to make themselves feel better. Um, but uh, for the most part, you know, it, it's, it's, it's essentially trying to provide a barrier to prevent spores from landing on there. Keep in mind that ceratocystis, we're talking about spores with this Eutypha botrysphyria complex moving in with the rain. Ceratocystis actually moves in with fruit flies and these different beetles that actually carry the spores that hitch a ride from and that are attracted to the wound of the tree. So that's why I'm saying no matter how you spray it, it's, it's, you know, it's just a matter if it's there or not. Um, and getting that tree to heal as fast as possible. I would say the other thing with ceratocystis, if you do have a lot of shaker damage, people like to take that flap of wood and take it back over, you gotta take it back around. <laughs> cut it all off, cut all that loose wood off the tree, and let that wound dry out. The quicker it dries out, the less flies and beetles will be attracted. So in some cases, I've actually recommended scoring the edges with the ray, or cutting a straight line with a razor blade back into healthy tissue in order to get that to heal a little bit faster. Hopefully none of you guys are working with that problem, but uh, Any other questions? As our trees approach 20 years, like some of us have some older orchards now, is there anything we can do to increase the longevity? So the question is, what can we do to increase the longevity of our orchards um, as they mature? First for me is irrigation management. Uh, what tends to happen as you have an orchard that's maturing is one, it's at the higher end of water demand, so we're applying a tremendous amount of water to these, to these orchards. 
Uh, so what happens is we start losing trees from shaker damage or pruning wound cankers or wind throw. And then we tend to have either a replant that's there or we have a hole in our orchard. I'll get to the replants in a minute. But the hole in your orchard means that you have now water being applied to the field that's not being withdrawn from the field. So if you have a sprinkler here and no tree sucking that water out, that means you're actually going to begin to gradually over irrigate that area that you're within. So going through and, and being trying to either scale that emitter down or shut emitters off in those different cases to prevent that over irrigation that's occurring. And this is why, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but you see it in aerial imaging, you always tend to get a little bit of a pattern associated with tree loss. And they always tend to be found around themselves. And I think a lot of it has to do with water. And uh, over irrigation just kills roots. It, uh, most of us think of Phytophthora as being the problem with over irrigation, but really it's, it's uh, asphyxia. It's essentially lack of oxygen in the root zone that kills the fine, fine feeder root development, and then the tree begins to suffer, begins to take less water, and then Phytophthora moves in or just flat out dies. Um, the other thing is, is I'm, I'm not against uh, pruning, even though we just talk about yield, but uh, going through and, and kind of limiting these trees up, I think, help us make makes us feel that these orchards are more productive as well as it gets those snags out of the way for tractor equipment. Um, but we do know that generally pruning won't invigorate new fruit wood. In that I mean, it will provide new fruit wood, but it's not a needed practice for the future orchards. So we need some pruning to help make the orchard a little bit more operational so you're not doing as much equipment damage. It helps. And then the third thing is working on your water infiltration problems, which actually I didn't cover, so thank you Joe for this reminder. Um, making sure we're able to get the water into the ground so we're not keeping those trees in saturated soil conditions. So I always bring this up as kind of a matter of, of context. When you look at how we apply water to the field, so if we're applying, let's say, four acre feet of water to our orchards, and we're applying that uh, through flood, that essentially means we're putting out four acre feet over 90% of our orchard surface area. Now when we constrict that to a microsprinkler pattern, we're around 30 to 40% of our orchard surface area that we're applying that water through. When we go to drip, we're now down to around 20%. So if you think that you're taking four acre feet and you're putting it through 20% of the surface area, you're essentially putting about 20 acre feet of water through that soil crust. And it's very easy to leach out all the minerals, and essentially the, the organic matter that keeps that soil open, keeps it open. So, you know, think, things that we tend to do, you know, we tend to rely heavily on gypsum. If you're slightly acidic, you can use lime, but cover crops help in managing these problems, as well as in some cases, severe cases, going through and doing a little bit of deep ripping to help try to open that soil back up to get the water to go in. Uh, generally, we don't feel it in the spring, we don't feel it in the fall or the winter, but we definitely see it in the middle of the summer. So remember back to how that soil was taking water back in uh, July and August. And if you weren't, if you saw a lot of puddling and you saw a lot of saturated soils around the drip line, take some of that soil sample around where the water hits, uh, take some of the soil around that wetting pattern and get it analyzed to see what we need to do. It could be that we need some calcium, some magnesium to get back into that, that soil back into balance. So, you know, as a whole, kind of those three practices, that it all kind of comes down to water management. Um, that's one reason why we keep kind of spacing our orchards a little tighter, so when we lose trees, we're not losing as much canopy. Um, but at some point, probably around 30, 25 to 30% loss, depending upon who you ask and how pencils out, it's usually time to take it out. Um, then again, I see a lot of orchards. Some people will go back in and replant. My thought is, is it, it's going to take you five years to get that replant into production. So if you're going to be pulling that orchard within five years, don't throw good money after it. It's it's fine. Just let it go. And I know it bothers people, but you know I had one farmer who lost like I forget 15 trees per acre. He said I couldn't stand, but I was like, don't replant if you're pulling the orchard in two to three years. He's like, I couldn't stand looking at. It the holes in my orchard so and he pulled it like two years later anyways so um yeah five years is what it's going to take to get that tree in the barren any other questions can i answer that one all right joe i think so i have one yeah, yeah. in time your trees broke it now has a few different varieties from round to flat well, I always have comments. I don't know. If, uh, I don't know if they're worth anything, though. Uh, 
So when it comes to tying, I like the rope that sits a little flatter on the limb. And mainly it's if you look at a round twine seems to kind of grow into the tree a little bit faster. Um, when it comes to me tying trees, people hate what I like to say about tying trees. I think as when you go into that second leaf, tying pretty firm around the scaffolds, but not too firm that they can't spread. You gotta let them be able to relax a little bit when they get some crop. And so the tree actually won't be too tight. You gotta let them be able to fall, fall down a little bit with some weight. Every year that tie needs to be either loosened and, and white or removed. So this is what drives people nuts when I say this. You got that scaffold tie after that second leaf, and then you go in, going into the third leaf, tie a little higher. A lot of people like putting the big loop in it. So that means they come back maybe in the third or fourth leaf, loosen it up, and allow those limbs to relax a little bit. It's good. So you don't have to go through and actually re rewire the tie through. I think that's a good strategy. But that bottom tie needs to come out. Because otherwise, it'll just keep. The wood will grow into it, and it'll keep the tree too tight. Um, I like seeing trees tied to be the fourth or fifth year, depending on the comfort of how they're going to hold. Um, but not before. Well, starting up no later than that point. I like seeing them probably in either the winter or the spring of the second leaf. That's when you're running your first scaffold tie through. That carries you through the second year. The third year you go a little higher, you leave a big loop in it, and then between the third and fourth you open that loop up, allow the tree to relax. And that's generally seems to me be a reasonable sufficient tie program. Some people carry it into the fifth between the fourth and the fifth year one more year. With independence, it's a little bit different. Uh, I bring that up because it's now 30, 31% of our industry. If you guys haven't been keeping on touch with the trends. Um, I, I think going into your second year, if you're trying to cross those things your second year, you need a double climb. Uh, they, tend to, they, they tend to bear really heavy at the end of the wood, and they'll flop. So you need to tie low and then go up a little higher and tie them a little, again, higher. So that's the one variety that seems to bear really heavy that second year on wood that just can't support the weight and it will tend to fall over. So if you're going to leave the long room, because you want to you get the nuts, put the money in and double time. Otherwise, you're going to go right back through them and cut all those nuts off uh, that you're wanting to grow to be. Countless orchards I've been in, I said, oh, I don't think you need the time. I come back three months later and say, oh my God, cut it all off. So it just works and it just can't work. Uh, I should add that uh, with independence, I know a lot of people. Is there any more questions on tying before I jump into independence? It sounds like regurgitation on this, throwing out all kinds of stuff that's <laughs> probably not useful to anybody. Um, independence, remember, I, we think within the university you still need bees. Uh, I know that the nursery is saying something different, but when we done our screen test, uh, we do find a benefit from putting bees. I don't think you need per acre. I think somewhere, depending on how, how many bees your neighbors are getting, somewhere between 0.5 to, to 1 high per acre would probably be sufficient. Uh, if you're surrounded by nobody, you probably want to go closer to 1. If you're surrounded by a non prel orchard, you probably go around 0.5 to 1 in, in general. And the stronger the hive, the better, uh, just to help with that. You're, you are able to get a commercially acceptable crop with no bees. But you know, commercially acceptable could be 2,000. One with bees, it could be 400. We tend to see somewhere around a, between a five and 12 percent increase in yield when we use bees as a pollinator within, within self-pollinating varieties. So I just thought I'd throw that out there since you guys are probably making bee orders next year. Any other thoughts? Okay. Because I know what Jalinda's going to get, so. All right. Well, thank you all for your attention. And, uh, you know, I'm going to hand it over to...